mercy and peace be unto you from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Transformers, being transformed. Yeah. It's, a, it's an illustration of what God tries to do with us, wants to do with all people. But not all will be transformed. They will not will it. They will against it. And so they don't see what God is trying to do in their lives. When Peter, James, and John went with Jesus up on the Mount of Transfiguration, not knowing that's what was going to happen. When they went up and the, the, the inner circle of His disciples, uh, they were the ones that were also permitted to go with Jesus and seeing the, the raising of the woman's child to life again in the upper bedroom and giving the child back to the mother. It was you know, those three disciples. And as they're up there, they were the ones that were often were closest to where Jesus was going to be praying when He went off to pray. And so, this was, they were accustomed to this kind of a, an adventure uh, with Him. And so they go, but this one was very, very special because they saw this transformation, this, this figure to be changed and, and to describe it, it was not only uh, his figure, his body, but the clothes that he was wearing was better than any laundry today could do with the, with the finest of whatever of our selections of bleaches are and uh, other whiteners and other kind of things, greater than any of that. It was bright, uh, similar to like if the sun were shining today through one of those windows and it, it does and kind of makes it so you can't sit over here. And uh, you know, that kind of even brighter than that. And that they were there with, there was Jesus and Moses and Elijah. They knew it was Moses and Elijah. How? I don't know. They didn't have name tags. Uh, Jesus didn't introduce them. But it's a glimpse into what heaven is going to be like when we're going to know everybody there. And they had that moment of a heaven-like experience as they see Jesus and Moses and Elijah together discussing the Exodus. Not Moses' Exodus, Jesus' Exodus. The, the final events leading up to His death, burial, and resurrection and ascension. His exodus from His completed work as a human being in time and in creation. And they're discussing that. And why Moses and Elijah? Well, they represented the Old Testament and all of its prophecies as they got together to talk about, you know, the things that are going to happen. So I've said each year by, when talking about this event, for me it was like in the Army when we are the night before a, an exercise, in my case because I never was in a battle scenario, but there was practicing for the battle scenarios. But all the leadership would get together that could. And they would go over all the plans for the, for the battle coming up. You know, all the contingencies, where everybody was going, what everybody was going to do, so that everything, they understood where the plans were and they were certain that everybody understood and that they had passed this information down as much as could be to the lowest echelons that could be passed and so forth and so on. So Jesus, Moses, and Elijah. Moses representing the first five books of the Bible that he wrote, and Elijah representing all the prophets and all the prophecies of, of all the details of what would take place and the Messiah would come and would die, but not a bone of his body would be broken, and that he would be wounded, and that he would be buried, and all and would be in the tomb for three days and all and then rise again to life. All of those minute details, a thousand of which are in the Old Testament. And they're discussing all of that, putting it together. You can imagine how, however much of that conversation Peter, James, and John heard, with the magnificent brightness of their rabbi, their master, their teacher, and if they heard any of that conversation, what in the world was going on, no wonder they were a bit frightened. Not knowing how that, what this was all going to take place, did not understand it. And, and Peter 
and his usual insistence on doing something or saying something or getting involved and putting his two cents worth in, sometime for good, sometime for evil. And so out of his fright, he says he wants to prolong the time and, and, and build uh, uh, little booths, or little tents, little cubbyhole places for each of them to stay in. And, and something to, to provide. They'll be his servants. That's why, you know, why, why do you bring three of us? There's three of you guys, three of us, and you want, each one of you had a servant. You can just see Peter's mind out of his fright. Just go, where is he going with all of that? One after another after another. And then the cloud came and covered them. And out of that bright cloud comes a voice. It says essentially the same thing they did. With the cloud at the beginning of Jesus' ministry, after he had been baptized by his cousin John in the River Jordan. And the cloud comes and the voice says, This is my beloved son, well chosen for this act of Savior. Listen to him. He says the same at the Transfiguration. It's more than our English is, when the English says, listen to him, it's like, okay, and we, what's he going to say? You know, it says, to him, be listening, not just now, but forever, because this transfigured God man is the Word of God, is God in the flesh, the Word of God, as John then later wrote. In his, in his gospel lesson, that in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. That Word was Jesus. So this is God, man, Jesus of Nazareth. And coming down from the mountain, Jesus told them, don't tell anybody, not even the other disciples, because it wasn't time yet. And unlike many of the people that Jesus healed, and the other things, uh, whether he sealed their mouths so that they couldn't speak those things, we don't know. But apparently they were able to keep that command of Jesus and not talk about it until after his death, resurrection, and the coming of the Holy Spirit, when finally it could all be put into the proper perspective and understand. Finally they could see through the cloudiness of their own ambitions for the coming Messiah that, that were dashed with his death and see through all the things that were their expectations that didn't get fulfilled. And so they, they then finally understood and they recorded it. Peter, John, recorded it in writings that we have. Paul, who saw his own revelation of the resurrected Jesus on the road to Damascus as, as he was changed from being the persecutor of Christians into being the proclaimer of Christ's gospel, changed Paul, transformed him from the sinner to the saint. Because that's what all of God's revelations have as its objective. To change us from the sinful beings that don't want to see what God has to say. To transform sinners. To proclaim to be the saints of God. Problem is a lot don't do that. A lot won't accept it. It's one of the things that we're going through in our, in, our, uh, in our public and private life in our culture today. They are trying to officially, legally dictate you know, that old uh, separation of church and state. That only applies in one direction. The church is not to have any influence upon the community or upon the government. But the government has the authority and the power to dictate to the churches. And I don't know whether you uh, saw the flap this week about the uh, men, 
the only leadership of the churches of our, of our nation that they apparently could find to testify before Congress uh, with regards to the health care issues and the uh, provision required of all organizations with insurance to uh, provide uh, contraception for, uh, for their employees. If you didn't read it closely, the funny looking guy with the big mustache, that was the president of the Lutheran Church Missouri Synod testifying before Congress this week. Uh, his testimony is online. You can go to lcms.org and, uh, and go to that because it's a very, very critical issue for the proclamation of the gospel, for the expression of our faith. Because it doesn't just involve the uh, uh, pro free provision of birth control pills and uh, prophylactics, but it also involves the morning after pill and abortions. And to require that as of uh, the faith-based organizations who still yet make a profession of faith and the impropriety, the sinfulness, the contrary to God's will nature of those activities is a suppression of our freedom of religion in this country. So it is a key factor. It's not new. This is a process that has been going on since the very beginning because sinful man has veiled as to what God has in store for us. Sinful humanity does not want to hear about God and what God has for us, much less what God requires of us. It was that way when the commands of God were given at Mount Sinai. That's what Paul was talking about when Moses came down from the mountain. The people could see, having been in a face-to-face -face discussion with God of all these things, Moses' face shone like the sun. And when he was giving them God's words, they endured that brightness. But when he had finished telling them what God told him to tell them, they required him to put a veil of his face when he went about the rest of, the, of his tasks and duties as the leader of the exodus and the journey through the wilderness. They could not stand the presence of God. And what Paul talks about in the letter to the Corinthians is that that physical veil that was over uh, Moses' face was representative of the veil over the heart of the descendants of Abraham who also refused to accept that Jesus of Nazareth was the fulfillment of the Old Testament prophecies of the coming Messiah. And that that veil is still there to this day.